Hello there and welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, my name is Michelle Ferre and I am a fourth grade teacher in Maryland. Listen, I did not want to make this video, I did not have plans to make this video, but due to recent events, I am making this video. Because of the coronavirus, our state school superintendent, I think that's her title, made all Maryland public schools close for two weeks starting on Monday, March 16th. And I know that we are not the only state doing this. I've heard of a lot of schools that are either closing or are close to closing. So I felt like I had to make this video. And I know there's a lot of controversy with the coronavirus and I'm not really here to get into that, but regardless of what you believe, the facts are that even though this virus is not overly dangerous for kids, it could be dangerous if they pass it on to other members of their family and it's about keeping the community at large safe. So I'm going to break this video up into a couple different parts. I want to start with tips and suggestions for any teachers who are still in school when it comes to the coronavirus. Then I'm going to go into ideas and tips for teachers who are no longer in school and have to administer instruction to their students or have to prepare things to send home with students so that hopefully no matter where you are on the spectrum, this video will be helpful for you. So we're gonna jump right into it by starting with what you should do if you are still in school. I want to begin with some tips for discussing the coronavirus with your students because let's be honest, our kids are talking about it. Earlier last week, we had actually been informed that our field trips were all canceled and so of course my kids came in the next day, they were all asking me about the field trip and I had to address it with them, okay? Because once one kid starts talking, it spreads and before you know it, all of the kids are talking. It's like a virus. It might be too soon to make that joke, but you get the point. Tip number one is to remain calm and reassuring when you are speaking with students, but also when you're speaking with other staff members because you never know when students may be listening or overhearing your conversation. Kids in general really respond to your tone and they can tell if you are scared or anxious or stressed, so try to control it as much as possible and just maintain a calm and reassuring demeanor. Tip number two is to remind students that adults are working to keep them safe. Oftentimes, kids hear a small part of a conversation between adults or they hear a little bit of what's going on in the news, but they don't fully understand the scope of what's happening. So it's super important that you reassure them by letting them know, hey, you're a kid, you don't need to be afraid or anxious about it. Adults are doing what is in their power in order to keep you safe. Tip number three is to be honest and accurate. Let's face it, kids are going to ask questions. They're curious, they wanna know what's going on. And instead of completely avoiding the conversation, it's okay to be honest with them and present them with facts. Obviously, the amount of information you give them definitely depends on their grade level. You're not going to give a kindergarten student the same amount of information that you would give a high school student. If you do teach at the elementary level, I highly suggest a video by Brain Pop. It's a free video. It talks about what the coronavirus is and how it spreads, and it even gives tips for helping prevent the spread of the virus. There is a video, but there also are additional resources. There's readings, there's quizzes, vocabulary, tons of things that you can use with your students. Obviously, part of being honest and accurate is not spreading misinformation. It can be really easy to just tell kids, hey, this isn't going to affect you in any way because you think that will make them feel better, but the reality is it will affect their lives. I mean, schools are getting canceled. You never know what could happen within your own community. So instead of telling them something like that, which may or may not end up being true, it's better to present them with facts that you have about the virus that are age appropriate and continue to reassure them that adults are doing what they can to keep them safe. Tip number four is to admit that you don't have all the answers. So often students look to their teachers thinking that their teachers know everything, but Newsflash, we don't <laughs> and we never will and that's okay. Instead of putting on this facade that you do have all the answers and you know everything that's going on, admit to your students that you're still learning about it just like they are and you don't have all of the answers and the country as a whole and even the world as a whole 
do not have all the answers, but encourage them to speak with their families. That way they can make sure that they're getting information that their families want them to have. Tip number five is to make yourself available to your students. Every student is going to handle the situation differently. To some students, they hear about it and they just say okay and they continue on with their lives. But for other students, especially students with anxiety, it may be something that they dwell on for several days or even weeks. Let your students know that you are available to talk with them, give them reassurance, and just love and care for them. Tip number six is to use it as a teachable moment. This is the perfect opportunity to discuss topics such as prejudice and stereotypes stereotypes against certain groups of people. I know personally I have already witnessed several examples of prejudice and stereotypes within the media and on social media towards certain groups of students based on where the virus initiated or began. So it's important if any of these topics do present themselves in your classroom that you're able to address it in a way that will teach your students. And finally tip number seven is to keep your routine as normal as possible. Yes I'm laughing as I say this because this time of year is already super hectic and then you add the coronavirus on top of it and it just becomes mass chaos but your students are going to function best if you just proceed with your normal schedule you don't try to spend too much time talking about it you address things as they come up and then you move on with your normal schedule to keep things as consistent as possible next let's move on to things you should be doing within your classroom in order to keep things clean and prevent the spread of any germs or at least minimize the spread of germs because let's face it in a school you're never going to fully prevent it first and foremost make sure you encourage your students to be washing their hands and you may even need to take some time to teach them how to properly wash their hands Part of this is included in that brain pot video that I already mentioned, which I will link for you down in the description box, but you may even want to set aside 15 to 20 minutes to teach a lesson to your students about hand washing. One of my favorites that I used to do with my second graders, but I would even still do it with my fourth graders now, actually involves glitter, which I know sounds scary, but it's not. You pick one student and you pour a little bit of glitter into their hand. You have them rub it around on their hand so it spreads all over over them then you have them touch another student's hand and they will actually see that the glitter transferred from one hand to the other and that glitter helps to represent germs so you can have a great conversation about how germs spread through contact then you can have the students wash their hands and wash the glitter off to show them that that's how you remove the germs you can also post signs around your classroom or even around your school to encourage hand washing. You don't have to make the posters yourself, okay? Get your students to make them. I have had tons of students in my classroom volunteering to make posters because they're all wanting to support each other and make sure that they all stay healthy. You can even create incentives for hand washing. I have seen teachers do some pretty creative incentives for hand washing. One teacher even put a stamp on her students' hands and if it was gone by the end of the day because they washed their hands enough they would earn a prize. Personally I had a girl in my class who was creating little sticky note badges for the hand washing squad <laughs> for any students who she saw washing their hands. I thought it was absolutely adorable so get creative but find ways to encourage your students to wash their hands. You also need to spend some time cleaning your classroom. I know this time of year we're all busy. Okay I feel you. I just had grades due. I had conferences. I had both of my SLOs due. It's a lot. However, above all of those responsibilities, your health and the health of your students comes first. Make sure you are using approved cleaning products for this and also consider any respiratory concerns for some of your students who may not be able to be around certain cleaning products. I know you've probably heard most of that or at least seen it all over Facebook or social media. I get it, but truly that is what you need to be doing to help prevent the spread of germs in your classroom. Next, let's move on to what to do if your school actually does close. Before I get into any of this, I want to talk about equity. Before you consider administering online instruction, you need to figure out if your students have access not only to devices, but to internet access. Unless your school actually provides students with devices, chances are not every student has a device at home. And even if they have a device, they probably don't have internet access. It is not equitable to assign online instruction if not all of your students can access it. 
You also need to keep in mind that not every student has support at home. Their parents may need to go work and they might be in daycare for the day or home by themselves. And you have to keep in mind that during the school day, there is support in place for those students, okay? You're helping them, or maybe a teacher's assistant is helping them, or another adult is helping them. If they don't have that same support at home, you cannot expect them to complete the work at the same rigor that you are giving them in school. Everyone's situation is different, so I'm not here to tell you what to do or what not to do because I don't know your situation, but I just want you to keep those things in mind as you make instructional decisions for your students. Now, if all your students do have device and are able to access the internet at home and it's going to be equitable for all of them, fantastic. I'm gonna start by giving you some ideas for instructional resources to use with technology. First of all, there are a ton of websites that are offering free premium subscriptions for teachers and sometimes even students. Now there's way too many to list in this video, which is a really good thing, so I'm going to link them all down in the description box. I highly suggest you take advantage of these opportunities because that doesn't happen very often for teachers, okay? Free online educational website subscriptions are not handed out every day, so definitely look into those options. My first tip for digital instruction is to try to use websites or programs that your students are already familiar with. Listen, I'm a huge proponent for teachers and educators trying out new educational technology, but this is not the time for that. You cannot introduce a brand new web tool for your students that you haven't been able to show them how to use when they may not have the support at home in order to figure out how to use it. So stick with websites and programs that your students are already familiar with. One example of this is Google Classroom. I have all of my students added into my Google Classroom, so this is one way I could administer online instruction. I actually have a couple of videos about Google Classroom. I have a very basic beginner video on getting started. I also have a video on creating digital assignments for Google Classroom, so I will link both of those in the description box if you wanna check those out to get started. One way you could organize all of your instruction within Google Classroom is actually to create a topic for each day of the week and then list the assignments for that day under that topic. That way it shows up in a concise manner. You may also want to consider posting a checklist with all of the items you expect students to complete that day. That way they can help stay on track and make sure they get everything done. If you are using a program like Google Classroom, you could even consider adding other teachers into your classroom. That way you can all collaborate together. This could include special area teachers or special educators or even your grade level teachers. Tip number two is to consider posting a short video each day. I'm not talking about a 15 minute lecture, okay, because your students are probably not going to watch that, but you could post just a one to two minute video where you're greeting your students and giving them a short synopsis of the directions for that day. Listen, your students are missing you, okay? If you're not in school, I guarantee you, your students are really wishing they could be with you. So posting a short video helps to make things more personal and it helps you feel like you're still connected with them even when you're not there. You can record this with a webcam on your computer or even your iPhone and then you can just upload the video straight to Google Classroom. Tip number three is to reduce the amount of work. By no means should you be assigning students the same amount of work that you would be doing in the classroom if you're administering online instruction. Again, you are not there to offer support to students, so what they're able to do independently is going to be vastly different than what they can do with support. You could even consider splitting up your subjects to different days. Maybe Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you focus on reading. Tuesday, Wednesday, you focus on math. You sprinkle in a little science and some special areas and you're good to go. But you don't have to hit every single subject area every single day. Tip number four is do not implement hard deadlines. Lines. Every student's situation is going to be different. You don't know what's going on at home. You don't know whether their parents are in work or not in work. Maybe they're staying with someone different than normal. You have no idea. So it's not fair to implement these hard deadlines that students are expected to meet. And tip number five is to give students choice. 
I know personally in my class, I offer students choice as much as I can. And in these kinds of situations, allowing students to make their own choices with what they complete is empowering. You could create a menu of choices for students and maybe they have to complete a certain number of them for the week, but that way they can pick and choose what they want to do or what they're able to do independently. Finally, let's discuss what to do if school closes, but you're not able to utilize technology. Chances are, if you're in this situation, you're probably panicking the most and you're probably trying to make a million copies for your students. Above anything else, tip number one is do not send them home with a packet of worksheets. When was the last time you ever had a student get excited about a worksheet? I can't really think of one because it's not engaging for students. And the students who already excel at that skill will be able to complete it really quickly, whereas the students who still need support are gonna struggle and it's just not beneficial for anyone. So instead, I'm going to give you just a couple of ideas of things that you can give students to do that are going to be more beneficial for them. Tip number two, and this is my first idea for you, have students read. More than anything, that's the number one expectation of my students. I just want you to read. I want you to read a book that you enjoy, not a book that's necessarily at your level. Just pick up a book and read for the sake of reading and read because it's fun. Now, if you want to, you could certainly have them go the extra step and complete some sort of project with it, but you don't have to. There's so many times during the school day where students have to read and then answer questions or read and then write about it and they seldomly get a chance to read just for fun. So this is the perfect opportunity to give them time to do that. Tip number three is to give students a choice board of writing prompts. I actually have a set of 20 pre-made writing prompts for every single month of the year in my TPT store. I will link it for you down below. You can use the pre-made prompts or you can actually edit them to fit your needs. But all you would have to do is print out that month of writing prompts, send it home with students and have them respond to a certain number a week or a certain number by the time they return to school in a notebook that they're already using for class. Tip number four, now we're kind of going into math. You can have students play math games. Now again, this does depend on who's available at home, but if they have a sibling or a babysitter or a parent or a grandparent or another family member, they can actually play some pretty simple games just using a deck of cards. For younger students, you can have them play addition war or subtraction war, where each person puts down a card and they either have to add the numbers or subtract the numbers, and the first person to yell out the sum or the difference gets to keep the cards. You can do this with older students using multiplication facts, each person puts down a card, and the first person to yell out the product wins the cards. If you have games that your students frequently play in class, you could send home materials for them to continue playing them at home. Tip number five is to have students actually create their own math game for a skill that you're working on. This can be done with minimal materials. They can literally create a board game out of paper and using crayons or color pencils or markers. This is great because it can be adapted to any skill that you're working on and it would be something super engaging for students. Then when you come back to school on that first day back, you could even have them play each other's games. It would be a great way to reconnect after having time off. Tip number six is to have students look for real life examples of whatever skill that you're working on. Personally, we just finished up a unit on measuring angles, so you could have students find examples of angles in real life. You could have them label them. If they have access to a protractor, they can measure them. And it's a great way to get students to apply those skills to real life. You can also encourage students to participate in activities that would allow them to apply those math skills, such as measurement when cooking or baking. But above anything else, just keep in mind that you have to be flexible during this time. Yes, it's inconvenient and it's going to set us back in terms of instruction for the school year but your students health is more important along with the health of their family members it's all going to work out it's not going to be the end of the world and in the long run it's not going to be that detrimental as long as students are reading and maybe finding ways to practice some of those skills that they're learning it's fine. It's okay if they don't continue to receive new instruction. They can just practice the skills that they already have, try to stay fresh with it, and it will all work out in the end. 
Now the final thing I just want to leave you with to consider before I end this video is that extended school closures such as these can be very detrimental for some students. There are students who really look forward to seeing your face every day and getting a hug from you and having you there to support them. So figure out ways that you could maybe help support them at home. Maybe you write them a letter and mail it to them or maybe you post those videos on Google Classroom. Find a way to be able to still connect with those students and let them know that you're thinking of them and you're still here for them regardless of the situation. Also, some students may have difficulty getting meals during this time. For some kids, the only time they get lunch and breakfast is when they're in school. So consider reaching out to services maybe through your county or through other organizations that would be able to get these students the food that they need during this time. Okay, I feel like that was a lot, but I hope at least one tip was helpful for you. I know this is a crazy time. I'm experiencing it too but we're gonna get through it. It's all gonna be fine. Don't touch your face, wash your hands, and we're gonna get through it. I really hope that it was helpful. If it was, give the video a thumbs up. Share it out to your teacher friends. That would be wonderful. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't already and hit the notification bell so you do not miss any future videos. As always, thank you for watching. I love you all so much. Don't forget to put your positive pants on and I'll catch you in the next one. Thank you so much for watching all the way to the end of this video and for supporting my YouTube channel. If you want to check out any of my older videos, you can use the two links right down here. If you want to subscribe to my channel so you don't miss any future videos, you can use the link right up here. The links to all of my social media sites, my Teachers Pay Teacher store, my merchandise store, and my Amazon store are in the description box, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.